fucking doors. Yeah, yeah they'll all be there. Yeah, yeah. you need to get out there. And I said, mm, not today, maybe. I've got water trust. Chairman Couch. Yes. Uh, uh, Councilman McAtee will be voice voting today. All right. Thank you for sharing that with me. Laura, can you hear me? You're muted, Laura. Laura, you're oh, muted. Yes, I can hear you. So uh, I didn't get to watch the uh, mayor's press conference. What did he say the weather's supposed to be like tomorrow? Uh, the press conference is still ongoing. And I missed the first five minutes, but I did watch the weather at noon and it's supposed to snow tonight. So if I'm supposed to fly out of town tomorrow, is there a chance I'm not going? There's a chance that you're not going. You should definitely connect with your airlines because what's happening is airlines do not wish to bring their planes into Oklahoma City and have them sit overnight. We are having some issues with um, de-icing fluid. And so um, the, the they don't want to leave their planes here overnight. So check with your airline before you head to the airport. All right, it is two o'clock and I would like to call to order the uh, February 16th Oklahoma City Water Utilities Trust meeting. Thank you for joining us for the video conference meeting. We have a few announcements to make regarding the video conference meeting. If the video conference is disconnected at any time during the meeting, the meeting shall be stopped and reconvened once the connection is restored. If communications are unable to be restored within 30 minutes, items remaining for consideration will be continued to later today at 4 p.m. via teleconference. The agenda and documents are located at okc.gov. Anyone wishing to speak about an agenda item, public hearing, or to speak under citizens to be heard must call 405-297 2422 or email support ocwut support at okc.gov. Please provide your name, phone number, the item number, and the reason you wish to comment. If you call in after the item has been heard, you will be allowed to speak under Citizens to be Heard. Speakers will be allowed three minutes to comment. Staff will attempt to submit requests received during the meeting to the chair. Please press star six to speak when recognized by the chair. Um, before we move into the agenda, I do have a, a sad announcement this morning. I learned this morning that Marsha Slaughter has passed away this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, Marsha, many of you knew well, she was the utilities director from 2001 to 2016, maybe 15, right before Chris came uh, and uh, had been suffering some health issues. Um, and was in the hospital since Friday and passed away this morning. Uh, mm -hmm. She was a, a great friend. She was a, a very, very good engineer. Uh, she gave a lot to this city and this water utilities trust and, and we will miss her greatly. And on a personal note, she sat next to me during Thunder Games. So uh, she was someone I'd known and cared for for many years. Um, the next item on the agenda is approval of minutes. Uh, the minutes are for the February 2nd, 21st meeting agenda. Is there a motion? We have a motion by Trustee Martinez Brooks. We have a second by Mark Stone Cipher. Uh, please vote. Mac and Mr. McAtee, how do you vote? I vote yes, and I'll be voting audibly for after the meeting. Very good. It passes five to nothing. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, item three is the consent docket. Uh, it's a number of items. A lot of them are purchase agreements, or purchase, uh, agreement renewals. Um, are there any questions or comments about the consent, doc consent docket? Hearing none, is there a motion? It's been moved by Councilman Stone, so I've seconded by Trustee Martinez Brooks. Larry McAtee votes, votes yes. Mr. McAtee votes yes. And it's approved five to nothing. 
Item four is the concurrence docket. It contains two items. One item A is uh, an item that went before the city council this morning, and it is uh, has to do with the temporary suspension of charges during emergencies uh, like snow events that we had today and COVID events where we're uh, cutting off people's water. And that went to council this morning. And number B is a no cost change order uh, for a project on Villa Avenue. Are there questions or comments? Is there a motion? Motion by trustee Martinez Brooks, second by Councilman Stonecipher. Larry McIntyre yes. Mr. McIntyre votes yes. And it passes five to nothing. There are no emergency contracts. Moving on to item six, individuals for uh, items for individual consideration. Uh, item A, we have a presentation on project SC1009, the West Oklahoma City Wastewater Master Plan. Who's taking the lead on that? Uh, I'll start, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for allowing us to present this report. It's basically three things that we studied in regards to the report itself. And that was the uh, population projections and the ability to know the flows in the future years. Uh, we looked at future plant sites uh, of where we could locate and what was available to us. And then we looked at the collection system that would be done. This basin is basically located between 59th and US 66 and between Gregory Road and Fresco Road. It is a basin that has, that the ability is not there to serve it in any of our treatment plants. And it is going to begin development in the future. And what we've looked at is from five-year increments up to 40 years. Uh, we've, and so the team that we've put together includes Jim Johnson of Johnson Associates who did the uh, population and flow studies, AECOM who did looking at our plant alternatives and Triad who uh, looked at the collection system. So I'm gonna let Tim talk, start about the first phase of the report. Yeah, thank you. Um, if you can go to slide four, Crystal. There we go. So uh, as Don mentioned, the basin coverage, um, what we did was we took all the information that was available uh, from the city uh, through the, at the time, recently updated uh, plan OKC. Uh, and uh, we were at the time working on a, uh, a update for the Yukon comprehensive plan. So we were able to utilize the data that we were gathered and uh, spread the population uh, yeah. accordingly. Uh, anticipating how it would develop in private development uh, standards. Uh, we took then that information and uh, utilized where the current infrastructure was to, to develop a plan of how we'd spread it out over the de development years. Next slide. And you can see here just very simply, uh, this area this uh, area could grow into a small town of 115,000 people. And so anticipating uh, the growth pattern in the zero to five, six to 10, and taking advantage of what infrastructure is there and how best to serve the basin as time goes on. And uh, mains, water mains and sewer mains are extended by the uh, development community. Uh, it, we would ultimately get up to uh, just under 17 million gallons per day on the average. And then you can see on this chart how we broke it out uh, the, the bulk of the uh, area would be residential, a little bit of industrial, some commercial along I-40, and then neighborhood commercial would be the typical model that you would see uh, every couple of miles have a small uh, convenience or a retail outlet on a corner. Back to you, Don. Okay, next slide. In regards to the wastewater treatment plant, and you, as Tim's pointed out, the flow that we're gonna look at, we begin to look at, would the receiving stream be able to handle additional flow? And that receiving stream is the North Canadian. We evaluated the Yukon plant because it's in the drainage area and downstream 
of the West Basin. Then we sampled that part of it to see what the uh, treatment process was. And then we looked at uh, additional, uh, next slide please. And it looked at additional phasing. Okay, Crystal, one more. All right, and what we have here, this is just a picture of the existing plant. And as I said, we've looked at the discharge requirements, evaluated future options. Okay, Crystal. Next slide, okay. And what we did was trying to figure out the alternatives that we had. Uh, we could increase the permitted capacity of Yukon's plant, expand the Yukon plant, which in the bottom line becomes more uh, efficient. We could build a plant that both Yukon and Oklahoma City could use, or we could do a new, new plant uh, on a new site. The, the problem with the new plant on a new site was the expense. It becomes the most uh, expensive uh, over the period of time. And that basically you're looking at in the cost to expand the wastewater treatment plant for Yukon is 159 million. The joint one of the two cities would be 168 million. And a new plant, Oklahoma City by itself, would be 174 million. And that's with capital cost and total, total extension cost. Next slide, please. The interphase of phase one was to be look at, at Yukon expanding their plant for their own service to at least five million gallons a day. And to do that, we're going to have to look at changing it from an activated sludge to um, our, from an extended air to an activated sludge, I'm sorry, to give us more flexibility on the equipment design. Yukon is in that phase right now. They have started that study. Uh, next slide. Okay, and at this point, Dennis is going to pick up and we'll at the end, answer any questions. Uh, thanks, Don. You can go to the next slide, Crystal. Uh, <clears throat> the goal of the park that uh, the triad did <clears throat> in-house was <clears throat> to identify the development of an ultimate build-out of the collection system based on the projections that, uh, that were discussed and reported by Johnson Associate. Uh, the assumptions are that we, we would have four build phases, uh, 0 to 10, 11 to 20, 21 to 30, and then 31 plus years. And those construction dates for uh, the various phases would be every 10 years starting in 2025. Next slide. Uh, <clears throat> this gives, gives you an idea. Uh, Tim and Don both talked about the basin. It's about 20. 23, 24 square miles, and uh, north is to the right on this uh, diagram. Um, you, you can see the uh, how the, the trunk system, which is kind of shown in a teal color, and then the, the uh, collection system itself uh, in the more purple, uh, purple color, uh, and all that converges toward the north end of the basin. Next slide. Our, <clears throat> the flows are calculated for each bill phase, each trunk segment, and each tributary segment. Uh, we develop proposed grade lines uh, for each trunk segment and tributary segment based on the existing topography, and then establish pipe sizes for each segment and each build out phase. Uh, we took a look at estimated pipe size costs and we researched several uh, 2018 sanitary sewer projects in central Oklahoma, determined that the average cost in those projects was about $8, inch, eight per inch diameter per foot. Um, then we looked at the consumer price index and it showed a yearly escalation factor of 2% would be appropriate. So that is what we used. Um, and then we estimated cost per pipe size in the various build out years. Um, it was de uh, determined the proposed pipe size for each segment, the estimated length of pipe, and the build out year for each segment. Next slide. Well, a summary of our findings, um, and all this can be found in, in the report that we submitted to the utilities department last year. Um, <clears throat> the cost is in constructing the ultimate build out line size for each segment. Um, we looked 
at phasing those line sizes where you would put in a smaller line size and then come back in at a later date <clears throat> with a parallel line to increase it to the ultimate build out. But in each case that we looked at uh, for those comparing the ultimate build out uh, size versus phasing the, the lines, uh, each case, the present value of installing the ultimate pipe size was lower than the phased approach. So that is the direction that we went. Um, we also considered using the existing 18 inch line uh, in Yukon that goes to the water uh, wastewater treatment plant and so the capacity of that pipe is reached. Um, that would require a lift station and the existing pipe may only serve the build out for a very short time, maybe as short as two or three years. A uh, 42 inch gravity line was originally recommended from the north end of the basin to the Yukon treatment plant based on uh, AECOM's recommendation to expand the existing wastewater treatment plant. However, in our opinion, the depth of the gravity line was deemed to be too costly. We also considered a scenario of serving the basin as it develops with several regional lift stations. Uh, these will allow smaller pressure lines to be installed in the early phases and could be done by sharing the cost with the developers in each area. Uh, these pressure lines and lift stations could be abandoned or removed during later phases of the basin development. It was very difficult to estimate the cost on this approach uh, without knowing how the development would occur. Uh, perhaps as development does occur, and this is a, a, a direction that the city would like to go, uh, we could develop more current estimates uh, at a later time. The re recommendation chosen is to allow the various sub-basins to be provided with gravity sewer as those sub-basins develop. Uh, we would construct lift stations near the north end of the basin, uh, each lift station designed and constructed in phases uh, to the water treatment plant, uh, existing expanded water treatment plant. And as development occurs, the lift station would be expanded to accommodate the increasing flow. Um, additions to lift stations would be constructed um, and the pressure line will be bored through the roughly 50 foot hill that's downstream from the last lift station. Um, an additional pressure line would be installed with phase four, uh, which would obviously be about 30, 30 years away. Uh, lift station two would also be constructed in four phases and it will include a pressure line to uh, lift station number one. All estimated costs are shown in the last table. Um, which we'll look at in just a second. The, the next step that we would recommend uh, after receiving the report is for the Water Trust staff to meet with the City of Yukon for the purpose of entering into a memorandum of understanding for the implementation of fund. You can go to the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> this is just a, a very rough summary of the estimated cost by phase. You can see the various phases at the top, 2025 through 2055, uh, <clears throat> includes the cost of the lift stations, and then of all of the trunk and um, collection segments uh, on the various lines. And you can follow the costs um, as, as they go, the to total estimated costs. And keep in mind, these costs do not include uh, the work, as Don mentioned earlier, the work to be done to uh, the Yukon wastewater treatment plant in order to expand it to a uh, proper. Uh, with that, we'll open it up for questions. Um, and again, we appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Back to you, Mr. Chairman. Do any of the trustees have questions? I've got I a have couple. a quick question. Yeah, go um, ahead. Have we, I, I'm, I'm assuming we've already been talking initially with Yukon wastewater on this? Yes, yes, we have. yes, we have that. The Yukon has been briefed, uh, both the staff and uh, we have reviewed the report with them. Okay. And so the recommendation is for us to just accept the plan and move forward with uh, further discussions with Yukon, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Very good. And then a second question on this. Um, there has been some concerns expressed, especially last week at planning about some of the infrastructure drainage issues in the area, um, particularly that Southwest 15th to Southwest 29th. 
um, and just east of Morgan Road. This something like this, a plan of this nature would help address those concerns eventually. I don't know if they're related or not. I wouldn't think so. No, I can I can no. uh, respond to that real quickly. That I was at the planning commission and saw the that area. Uh, I think the the big solution will be the resolution of the Sarah Road construction and the completion of the turnpike. That will solve a lot of the problems you heard discussed at okay. that meeting. Okay. Thank you, Tim. You're welcome. So I've got a couple of questions. Um, what percentage of that drainage area is in Oklahoma City and what percent of it is in Yukon? 100% in Oklahoma City. What percent? 100. 100%. 100%. City. Yeah. Got it. And what school districts would they be in? Tim, you, there's four in there, Tim. Yeah, so it's uh, Yukon. Um, Banner. Uh, Banner. Banner. Yeah, I couldn't get Banner out of my head. Uh, and... Uh, Mustang. So there's three. I'm, I'm not recalling the fourth. Okay. So, uh, so there, there's an area out there that presently has very, how many people? Less than 3,000? Yeah, and most of the development's on small or on acreage tracks. Right. And we're projecting to be dropping the city of Norman in there, essentially. Correct? Uh, yes. 117,000, Norman's mm -hmm. somewhere in the 110, 120,000. Yeah. So you're, yes, you're it, really looking at dropping the city of Norman in that area out there. Have we run this through the planners and, and plan OKC? Yeah, uh, yes, so they were involved with uh, uh, providing us the information and we had several meetings with planning staff about the development of this tract and how they uh, thought it would develop and, and molded that into our uh, understanding. It seems to me that it'd be very aggressive, and I, I understand it's over decades for this to, to be implemented, but that that would grow um, within the next 50 years to have 120,000, 115, 117,000, whatever the number is out there. That does seem somewhat aggressive. <clears throat> Don't necessarily disagree. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman. Let, let, let me go back real quick to your question about uh, percentage uh, in Oklahoma City and in Yukon. It, Don, isn't, or in Tim, both of you, isn't there a small piece of the eastern edge of the basin that's actually in the city of Yukon? East of, east of Frisco Road? That's okay, but the lion shares in Oklahoma City. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. So yes, if it's, absolutely. It's, it's, it's if it's 95 five or something like that, the yeah. lion's share is still in. Right. Yeah. Right. So thank you for clarifying that. But that's okay. I um, do want to say, Jim, I do want to say that in my experience working with the planning department uh, several years ago, there is a great deal of pent up development demand out there in that area that's being uh, held back by the lack of wastewater. Uh, facilities in the area. I, I know UConn believes that. I just don't know to what extent that pent-up demand is. Not sure anybody does. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jim, yeah, there's one thing I think that's one catalyst, which is a Frisco Road interchange, which will be finished in about two years. And then I think you'll begin to see inquiries as to what can be done. Okay. I understand that, but is, will that be more or less an impact of the turnpike coming through uh, with the extension of the south turnpike that goes south and north of Mustang? I, I, there's, no, there's no answer to that, Don. I, I'm no, just saying I, I believe that that would be more of a significant input, impact in, in, in that area of growth than necessarily the Frisco interchange, although the Frisco interchange, granted, will, will make an impact. I don't disagree with it. Okay. Um, I'm just stating that I believe this appears to be very aggressive. Other questions? Is there a motion? Motion by Trustee Martinez Brooks, a second. By Laura Johnson. Please vote. Councilman McAtee. 
Councilman McAtee is going to abstain. He doesn't know enough about this to render an intelligent vote. All right. And it passes. It passes four with one abstention. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Item B is a presentation on phase 1A site development report, the Utilities Project Operations Center. Yes, thank you. Sorry, trying to get going here. Thank you, Chairman and Trustees. <clears throat> I'm here today to talk to you about the Operations Center for the Utilities Department. I'm gonna cover these four areas that are in the report, but basically this site is going to house 500 employees that actually come from five of the eight different divisions within the utilities department. So currently right now, we have uh, people located all over Oklahoma City. We have um, reservoirs and canals out by Lake Overholzer. We have the lab that is located at the Hefner treatment plant. We also have employees over at I-35 and 4th Street, which house, it's that used to be an old wastewater treatment plant that now houses our lift station employees. We have some admin staff downtown. And then we have uh, at the location where the new facility will be built, line maintenance, fleet, booster station uh, employees and meter employees. So this is kind of the existing layout of the current facility, kind of looks like a skewed state of Oklahoma a little bit. There is, oh, sorry about that. Got a little carried away. There is on the northern half of the facility is where line maintenance, fleet, or our meter uh, staff is, meter shop, and our flushing crews all house out of that department. On the south side of that facility is the old overholster treatment plant where um, that we have recently, well, we've de decommissioned over the last three to four years. And if you look over to the right-hand side are the existing um, above ground storage tanks. And then we have the new dual pump station that you've heard about. Um, where we've talked about connecting the two water treatment plants. So the new facility, this is kind of going to be the layout of what it's going to look like. Uh, the reason I pointed out those clear wells, because those are going to stay on site. Um, there's the dual pump station. Currently in the center of this white building here is our fleet facility that also will remain on site. Uh, the new, the bulk of the new facility is going to be built on the west side here. And you see an orange line on the south side of the property. That is really the only access that the public is gonna to have to that site where they can pick up meters and where semi-trucks can drop off uh, equipment and uh, materials to the warehouse. So kind of in the panhandle of the site, we've already built some of the employee parking, but with all the new employees that would be coming to the site, there would be an extension to that. We are also going to have a new fueling station, um, some covered storage for materials, and then covered storage for vehicles. So there are certain vehicles like our flusher trucks that in times like today in the winter that we cannot um, keep parked outside. And currently we rent facilities offsite to house these, um, this equipment. So one of the um, areas at the plant is this historical building. It's kind of used to house the old filter uh, facility for the overholster plant. We will be keeping the admin storage side of it and we're gonna be renovating that into the new lab facility. Now here's a rendering kind of looking from the northeast of the site. Uh, you can kind of see in the background the, old, the historic building that we were talking about, the above ground storage. There's a lot of parking showed there that we have uh, determined that is not needed, but um, this is kind of an over a layout of the other site. Um, 
And then here in the center is where we're going to house some of those vehicles that can't be parked. And we also have the ability to drive through the facility and park also equipment in there needed in snowstorms like today. So here's kind of a ground view of that. Again, this is the front area where the public, the only place where the public can um, actually have access to. So it is gonna be roughly a total square footage of 120,000 square feet. But included into that is the lab, which is actually just being renovated as part of um, the historic building. Again, it's going to include some of that storage that we currently rent off-site locations for. And then, of course, the new operations building and the new warehouse. And this is going to be roughly $25 million. Also included in this is site improvements. It's going to cover uh, about $6 million worth of parking, a new fueling station, um, some storage bays, and covered materials. Also included is about um, another $4 million in demolition. This is to, uh, for demoing parts of the plant that will no longer be used, including the lagoons, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with, um, the Hefner Lagoon. And then um, the old line maintenance facility, which actually has asbestos. So the total cost of this whole project is gonna be about $35 million. And with that, I'll answer any questions you guys may have. Thank you. Trustees, do we have any questions? Crystal, will all, so this means all operations will move to this one centralized facility? All utilities field operations will move to. So you uh, all will stay down on West Main? Yes. Okay. Kind of like fifth and pin, basically. Got it. So, I understand this is a uh, $35 million is a lot of money to spend into this. And I know that with the breakout that there's five to four to $5 million in, in prep work because of the lagoons and getting the site ready. That makes sense to me. 100,000 square feet for the operation center for 18 million. That's $180 a square foot or if you go on the other sheet, it's a $150 a square foot. That's kind of in the ballpark, I would guess. That doesn't, I mean, that yes. seems reasonable to me based upon costs of other facilities. Fleet parking at 600, vehicle wash, uh, fuel station, covered storage, demo line maintenance in the shop building at 4.6, north paving 2.3, and then re uh, repurposing the, the uh, filter building to 4 million, gets you to 35. Um, and I guess my only question for the general manager is with your capital program that's out there and all the other needs that we're trying to fund like the Toka pipeline and, and uh, uh, water plant, wastewater plant upgrades, um, can we fit this into our CIP uh, with the existing proposed rate structure? You're on mute, Chris. Sorry, the capital program includes this facility funded at this level, and it's been it's been programmed for quite some time. I asked the same question, and it fits right in with the capital program as as presented to trust a number of times over the years. So my answer is yes. All right. Other questions regarding this project? Jim, I have a question. Can you answer very quick, very shortly? Is this going to be, can be funded? Do we have the money to do this? Yes. Well, we will. It's in the capital plan. What, what so the mean? capital plan with rate modifications can be funded, correct? It is in the five year capital plan. With the rate increase or not? Um, well, they will be proposing a rate in increase this summer or spring. Yes, sir. The rate increase will include um, all capital projects that have currently been presented and approved by the trust and council. And this is one of the projects within that capital program.
Are there other Crystal, questions? Crystal, maybe this question is for you. Why would the public be accessing this facility? Our, I saw that you mentioned that that was the only spot where the public had access to. So um, the public now currently comes to the meter shop to, um, to get meters for a variety of locations for construction and um, uh, new homes and, and those variety of things. And then the other part is for the delivery of um, materials to the warehouse. Okay, I see. Thank you. Are there other questions? Is there a motion to uh, receive the presentation and receive the development report and uh, authorize negotiation of amendment for architectural services? Trustee Johnson made the motion. I seconded it. Please vote. Mr. McAtee. Which yes. And it approved. By the way, is Mr. Stonecipher still there? He voted electronically, Chairman. Okay. It passes. I have some trustee. Do any of the trustees have any comments? I do. I have a quick question. Just based on what happened um, with the water uh, being turned off night before last uh, because of the, the issue at Draper, um, I was noticing, trying to, because people were sending me questions and asking me about what was going on with the water. And so I looked on the utility app and noticed that we have some different ways to do alerts and messaging. And so, but when I looked at the alert, um, and the different little exclamation points that it had within the Oklahoma City area, there wasn't anything that I saw where it was said, this is impacting X number of customers. I did see um, Jennifer's message that she posted through the city and on the Facebook page, but I was wondering if we could push out a notification through the app to let people know that there is an outage, your water pipes didn't freeze, um, you know, I just think it would be a little bit more helpful if we could push something out um, through the app to make it more helpful. Yes, ma'am. I'll get folks working on that. Other comments by trustees? Good comment, appreciate that. Chris, I assume that you are planning to talk a little bit about some of the um, readiness efforts that you've made at the water treatment plants and some of the issues that have arisen over the last couple of days with the Draper plant and also the um, number of leaks and breaks. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm getting ready to do that. Okay. So as an item from the trustees, I, I would just say that um, my compliments are, are off for the uh, water utilities workers especially those that are standing in cold water all day, trying to get line breaks. I uh, appreciate them very much. We're in uh, unprecedented historic storm times and uh, nobody, nobody planned for this, but our crews are responding extremely well. Thank you, Trustee Johnson. I couldn't agree more. Other comments from trustees? General Manager report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I'll start with a status report. Both plants are fully operational. We've had a couple of problems at Draper. Uh, the chlorine system is uh, the chlorine feed system actually goes from the chlorine building over to the uh, uh, treatment trains through a covered trench uh, that's about 150 feet long. Uh, sometime on Sunday, uh, the pipes in that trench froze and we had a couple pipes broken. Fortunately, they were not the chlorine feed um, lines. They were the uh, vacuum lines. We repaired those lines and the system was put back in service. It took us about five hours to uh, complete the work. 
Um, today, we had a problem with the line feed system. One of the lines in the line feed system broke and we had it repaired and back in service within about two hours. Uh, we have had some generator issues at um, both uh, Hefner and Draper. At Draper, uh, we have a chemical that, that is used in the scrubbers for the generators and that chemical actually froze. And so we had to uh, uh, make provisions to thaw it out so we could get the generators uh, going again. Um, that is in, in process now. Uh, Caterpillar's on site working on that uh, for us. At Hefner, we have portable generators and they are uh, outside. Uh, we don't have a building for those generators. And as you can imagine, um, this time of year, diesel engines are very difficult to operate. So we're uh, working out there to get those generators operational. So the plan is um, to um, run the plants on generators for the next few days. And, and there's, there's two reasons for that. Number one, under a normal storm protocol, we run the plants on generators so that they don't start and stop. That puts a major impact on our water distribution system. So we will be running the plants on the generators uh, as much as possible. Secondly, we're having some issues with the power grid. So we'll be pulling a lot of uh, energy consumption off the grid by running the plants on the generator. So that's the plan. Um, in line maintenance, we've had dozens of main breaks over the last uh, week or so and hundreds of service calls. Many of the calls are, um, you know, people's service lines uh, freezing and breaking and we have to go out and turn their water off. So we've had over 300 of those. Um, with the cold weather and people running their faucets, um, our water demand is actually at summertime level. We're running almost 150 million gallons a day right now, which is totally unprecedented. Normally we, we pump about, about 80 million gallons a day this time of the year. So we're almost double our normal water demand. Um, so anyway, that's, uh, that is the status. Um, are there any questions on the status before I get into the arrears numbers? Any questions for Mr. Browning? All right. Okay, so I'd give you an update on the arrears. We've been pretty successful working with our customers to get them either on a payment plan or current on their past due bills. So right now we have reduced the number from 16,000 to 6,000. Uh, the, the amount uh, dropped from nearly 10 million to 5.5 million and 4.25 million of that is water sewer. So we're doing uh, pretty well in, in working with folks to get their bills paid or get them on a payment plan. So um, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. All right, any questions for Mr. Browning? Uh, Mr. Yeah, Browning, I think that is tremendous on the amount of arrears that have gone down. Was there a particular effort that you all put forth to make that happen? Because that's yes. a tremendous improvement of where we were last, last time. Yes, ma'am. Our customer service group has been doing an excellent job getting in touch with customers who are past due and working out payment plans with them or getting the uh, customers to pay their past due bills. We also have been working very hard to get them aligned with the CARES funding that's available. And so we've been uh, fairly successful there, not as much as we wanted because most of the CARES money went to gas and electric, but uh, we're still working with people trying to get them money to help them pay their bill. Well, thank you so much. That is a tremendous effort and I know it took a lot of different people. So thank you. It's good yes, to hear. I'll pass that along. All right, any other questions for Mr. Browning? I understand there are no citizens to be heard. So therefore we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, yeah.